Hello, sir. Would you like to try some chocolate hummus? You say chocolate hummus? You know what he just did? He just insulted my grandmother. Yeah. The hell with your culture. Lo siento, I did not know that hummus was Mexican. It's not Mexican. It's Palestinian. You know what? There's a lot of misinformation out there. No, it's not your fault. Do you always carry that with you? Yeah, some people carry hot sauce. I carry olive oil. Not just any olive oil. It's Palestinian olive oil. It's next level. Oh, it's going to be so good. I can't wait. The peat is for the hummus. <laughs> That's not hummus. Would you put chocolate chips on guacamole? Yeah, I don't think so. Yeah, yeah. trust me. All right. Mm. It's not bad. Uh-huh. It's really good. <laughs> That's a clip from comedian Mo Amer's new Netflix series, Mo. The show is making headlines for featuring the first Palestinian refugee lead on American TV. The semi-autobiographical series follows Amer's character, also named Mo, and his family, who flee Kuwait and are undocumented, living in Houston. Amr may be a comedian, but the show has tenser moments as well. Mo doesn't show, shy away from the trauma of the refugee experience and his character's lonely classification as stateless. Guardian columnist Arwa Mahadawi, also of Palestinian descent, outlines just how important this representation is, writing, Palestine is not exactly a major theme in popular culture. If you do hear the P word on TV, it's usually during the news and it's normally nothing positive. If we are on the telly, we're usually terrorists. All this is why Mo, a show that is unapologetically about being Palestinian-American, is such a big deal to me. I can't tell you how significant it is to see being Palestinian treated with humanizing humor. And that's not the only benefit of representation. It also creates real-life opportunities. Case in point, before getting his own show, Mo Amo was a recurring character on another pioneering show, Rami, starring Egyptian-American comedian Rami Youssef. And now Youssef is one of the creators and executive producers behind Mo, which is, of course, giving some major Netflix exposure to a new group of diverse actors. What's the opposite of a vicious cycle? Because this is that. Comedian and creator of Mo, Mo Amma, joins me now. Hey, how's it going? Mo, thanks. I'm good. Thanks so much for joining me on the show. Congratulations on your show. Let me start by asking you this. What does it mean to you to have the first show on American TV with a Palestinian refugee lead? What do you want to communicate about your experience to Americans who might only see Palestinians as people in the Middle East making trouble? First of all, it's a lot of pressure to put on one human being. <laughs> it's, yes. it's just, you know, in the end, it's about, you know, it's a story of, of uh, feeling, you know, belonging and seen as equal then to the person next to you. And to tell this story from a Palestinian family as a vehicle to share such experiences is very special. Uh, you know, doing it out of Houston, Texas as well, the most diverse city in America, the city that embraced me, raised me. And, uh, you know, I had to tip my hat to Houston of its uh, cultural diversity and, and the way it, um, you know, has never been portrayed also on American television as well, which is pretty astounding knowing it's the fourth largest city in America. And on top of that, showing the Palestinian experience from, you know, from my own, you know, real life story is very special and unique and makes me tense. You know, when you put it in those, when you frame it that way, it's, <laughs> it's a well, scary thing. You know, it's a scary thing and you want to be able to do it justice. So I, I'm not going to let it go. I've got one more question on this for you. The trailer Please. for the show highlights a great scene that I was just watching last night where you're buying olives for your mother. Let's have a watch. Where I come from, olive theft is a huge problem. Yeah, where's that? Palestine? Damn, that's a couple hours away. No, not Palestine, Texas. Israel, man. He, uh, Israel. Oh, shalom. Yeah, it's a real branding issue. <laughs> it is a real <laughs> branding issue. And it's kind of a very meta scene, because just by doing it and doing the show, you're helping fix the branding issue. Right. No, exactly. I think that we always, you know, Palestinians always say, oh, we don't have enough publicity. We don't have, well, we don't have a lot of stuff. We don't have any shows on television even that you can relate to. I mean, this, it being the first television show to do so. And also, like, making sure that, that we weren't, like, being overtly political and really focusing on the stories of each character and, and you know, and bringing that to light and making sure to put the characters in situations where, you know, they can be very funny but also very emotional and real and grounded. That was, like, the intention with the whole show. 
And do you think, Mo, that streaming services like Netflix and others have really opened the door for more representation on television, more services, more platforms equals more content, more opportunities for more diverse talent outside of the traditional network television? No, absolutely it has. And what a wonderful opportunity, especially like Netflix, which is a global platform, knowing that it's just, um, you know, after this, uh, you know, you have so many countries represented right away and you go out to this uh, global fan base and on one day, it's kind of mind blowing, to be honest with you, to be yes. getting so many reactions from all over the world. So it's it's something that's highly relatable. The show is really universal. The characters are are endearing and and honest and true and grounded. And and it's been it's been a wild experience to get messages from all over the world within a matter of minutes since the show dropped. Like really within the first few hours, I was already getting messages from all over the place. So. It's semi-autobiographical. I know a lot about your life, mm -hmm. you and I. Uh, our paths have crossed before, so it was interesting for me to watch it and say, sure. oh, yeah, oh, yeah. And, you know, yeah. you talk about being undocumented in the show. You talk about your citizenship application. I became a U.S. citizen in 2020, but I wasn't a refugee or undocumented. It was much easier for Congratulations. me. Congratulations. Uh, your, your, path, your path to citizenship, much longer, much more difficult, as with your characters mm -hmm. in the show. When did you become a citizen? How hard was it for you in real life compared to what we see on TV? Uh, very accurate. You know, it took me almost 20 years to get my citizenship uh, at that point. It was in 2000, late 2009 when I became a citizen. My mom took her 21 years. And people think like, oh, you're going out for the asylum process. You're getting, you, once you get granted asylum, you become a citizen. That's not the case. There's so much delay before you even get the court case and make sure that you're represented properly. It's also a big thing. You can get deported just off of finding a lawyer that's just taking advantage of you. You don't know that. You don't know, especially when you're move into a country and you think you're naive and you think everyone has the right intentions. That's not entirely true. Uh, it takes time to get the court case. And once you get asylum, if you're fortunate enough to get granted that, it takes you five years to get your green card, another five years before you can apply for citizenship. So it's a long process. It's a messy one. And uh, it can create a lot of um, issues for you. So it was a wonderful part of the show, the fictionalizing. It's like, what if I never found stand-up comedy or my purpose uh, in life? And what would that look like if I still had to work under the table to provide for my family and look after everyone and, and how easy it is to lose yourself also in this yeah. while you're trying to work so hard to, to make ends meet. And, and there's so many like emotional uh, things you try to juggle throughout that process. So we wanted to explore that in the, in the series. Well, I hope people who are watching will realize uh, we don't have an open border, far from it. Um, yes. Especially with the experience that you and your family go through in the show. Um, I want to play another clip from the show. Uh, let's have a watch. Classic and timeless, Ooh. just like my whip, bro. Hey, no, this ain't classic, it's just old. <laughs> my father gave me this car before he died, man. I ain't mean no disrespect, bro. Just, look, I can do 50. And now you're being disrespectful. Wait, 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 hold on, hold on. You don't just, deserve I, these. No, 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 Wait, 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 okay, hey, wait, wait. What? $100, come on, talk to me, talk to me, $100. You're getting closer. Look, I'm gonna throw in this leather case. Okay. Genuine leather. Okay. And this box with the proper paperwork, 125, period. Don't even try it, just say yes. All right, all right, all right, all right. Yeah, you got, you got a deal. Mo, so did you sell things out of the back of your car in real life too? And if so, what was the wildest sale you ever made? No comment. Yeah, I did. <laughs> I need to speak to my lawyer. Have the statute of limitations passed or not? <laughs> yes, I did. I did. I did. I was selling it. And the trick was I would always wear what I was about to sell. So that's how I attracted the clientele is that they would look at my sunglasses. This is when I was a teenager. And they're like, oh, man, where'd you get those sunglasses from? Oh, I'm actually selling these, man. He goes, oh, they're really nice. you know. And I would just be like, they're my last one. And I would sell them and then put on another pair of sunglasses. <laughs> it was, that was. Uh, <laughs> the last really one had... line is a good line. It's the last one. Yeah, it's the, the last one. Yeah, I would say the last one pretty frequently. And and uh, usually the, the guys that would buy it from me would come back at the end of the week. Man, I saw everybody wearing your stuff. Like, you lied to me. <laughs> I was like, no, no, really, in that moment, it was the last one until I uh, got a new shipment in. So, you know, but I do have a one-of-a-kind Movado, you know, and I genuinely, you know, and I would make another sale. I was just so there's good a, at it. There's an alternative, there's an alternative career path. You didn't go down instead of stand-up comedy sales. Uh, last quick. 
quick question yeah. before we run out of time. I, I remember watching you live in Toronto a few years back. We were doing an event together, and you told a story about 9-11. You were working as a kid at a flag store back then in Houston, if I remember correctly, on 9-11? That's correct. That's correct. I had a bunch of Texans coming in, you know, very upset about what happened. They had no idea they were buying American flags from Mohammed uh, whatsoever. And, so, and I ran out of the flags. And this guy was like, I, I need an American flag. I was like, I don't have any more American flags. I'm sold out. I sold 10,000 American flags within 48 hours. He goes, well, I need an American flag. I was like, you were so insistent on it. I was like, you know what? I have a Liberia flag, you know? It has the <laughs> red and white stripes, and it has a blue square in the corner with one big white star. He was like, I'll take it. I was like, what's going on? And he just walked out of the store waving a Liberia flag while chanting, America! I was like, no, West Africa, bro. That's definitely West Africa. <laughs> I, I, I wait to see that in season two of Mo.